Ah, Disney, Mickey Mouse, Space Mountain, DuckTales, and some very dark secrets they'd rather no one talk about. These are some of the darkest secrets of the Walt Disney Corporation. Disney might have been responsible for the mass killing of fish. The beloved Disney Pixar movie Finding Nemo involved some small sea dwellers making a daring escape via some drain pipes to the ocean where they could be happy and free, and that made a lot of little kids start wondering about their own pet fish. Are they happy in that tank? Many decided that their fish should be free as well, but when they flushed them down the toilet, most of those pipes led to sewers instead of the ocean. The sequel, Finding Dory, thankfully did not involve any drain-based escapes. And when Walt Disney wanted a movie, he was not one to let anything get in the way. In the 1960s, Disney was getting into the business of making more live-action movies, and Walt wanted an adaptation of the classic British novel Mary Poppins. There was just one problem. P. L. Travers, the writer, was a prickly woman who saw her books as a tool for teaching children etiquette, and she had no patience for Disney's sentimentality. Walt Disney personally wooed her, convinced her to allow the adaptation, and she reportedly absolutely hated it, never allowing a sequel. That didn't stop Disney from not only releasing a sequel in 2018, long after her death, but then making a movie, Saving Mr. Banks, that cast the process of making the movie in a far more positive light. Sometimes Disney got in trouble for a little more than a second of screen time. The Rescuers was one of Disney's less-known movies, a simple caper of two elderly mice who run an agency that helps children and rescue an orphan girl from a malevolent criminal named Madame Medusa. But it was what was on screen for only the blink of an eye that got people's attention. After watching the movie on home video in 1999, people were sure they caught a glimpse of a topless woman. The split-second images can only be seen when the tape was slowed down or paused, but they were definitely there, and millions of videotapes were eventually recalled. And not one, but two movies had to be edited at the last minute due to real-world events. The September 11th attacks in 2001 shocked the world, and also threw two Disney productions into complete chaos. The alien adventure comedy Lilo and Stitch had originally involved a story about hijacking a small plane and crashing it into small buildings, which would have been bloodless in the movie, of course, but it was still inappropriate. Whole scenes of near-complete animation had to be scrapped. Smaller edits needed to be made to Monsters, Inc., where originally a whole building was going to be blown up for decontamination. Last-minute edits changed it to the building being put under a laser dome instead. Another national disaster led to a boneheaded move from Disney. It was 2020, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Disney parks were shut down, as were the movie theaters, and the company had several finished blockbuster movies in the tank waiting to be released. The company's only saving grace was its Disney Plus streaming service, which had millions of quarantined citizens binging Disney movies. So the movie-starved executives came up with a brilliant idea. They would put the remake of their classic 1998 movie, Mulan, up on Disney Plus, but charge an additional 30 bucks on top of the usual monthly subscription fee to access it. People were outraged, seeing it as price gouging, and when the movie was released, it only got a million downloads while being heavily pirated as soon as it was released. The experiment was tried a few more times before being thoroughly abandoned, and Disney Plus is now back to being an all-you-can-eat buffet. But not really all you can eat. Disney has released thousands of titles over its lengthy history as a company, and they're not proud of all of them. While Disney Plus was billed as the place to find the entire Disney library, hundreds of titles are still missing. Some are animated series from early in the company's Disney Channel history, which were never collected on video and are considered lost media. Others are live-action films that, well, the company would rather no one remember. The company released a lot of mid-budget comedies in the 1990s, like the infamous slapstick space comedy Rocket Man. The buffoonish tale of a goofball who becomes an astronaut is not currently available anywhere, which probably disappoints around, eh, five people. But if you ask some people, the streaming service might have a little too much. If you had to associate Disney with a word, odds are a lot of people would say family, and most of their entertainment matches with that. The most intense original properties you'll find on Disney Plus is Star Wars and Marvel content, which usually features bloodless violence and not much more. But a few years back, the company acquired Fox, which brought the X-Men rights back to Marvel Studios. It also meant that the company now had the rights to Fox's three R-rated X-Men movies, the dark and ultra-violent Logan and the rude, crude, and bloody Deadpool movies. They also picked up the grim and gritty Netflix adaptations of their street-level characters, including the infamous Punisher, who solves most problems problems with an assault rifle. And all those are now hanging around on Disney+, Plus, waiting for preteens to jump in after watching the X-Men cartoon. Now let's head over to the Disney parks, the happiest places on Earth, right?
One of Disney's most iconic rides, the Expedition Everest roller coaster, takes you on a rollicking ride through the Himalayas and an encounter with a vicious Yeti. In the original version of the ride, the Yeti would seemingly shake the mountain itself as it appeared, but there was only one problem. The special effect of the Yeti's movement was causing damage to the structure and it had to be shut down. So why hasn't it been replaced in years? Because the repairs would apparently require dismantling much of the mountain. So Disney's creative solution? Surround the Yeti with strobe lights to create the illusion of movement while the Yeti stays still. And the Disco Yeti has been confusing guests for over a decade now. It's not the only creepy animatronic in the parks. The first audio animatronic dark ride in the park, It's a Small World, is a relaxing boat ride through an international landscape of singing and dancing dolls. The relentlessly catchy song will stay stuck in your head all day, and maybe a lot longer. But what most people don't know is that the complex clockwork workings of the countless dolls are so smooth and fluid that they never stop. That means they're on a constant loop throughout the day when people sail through, and unlike every other ride in the park, they don't stop working at night. They just dance to nobody in particular. And when the parks were closed for months during the COVID-19 pandemic, they just kept dancing in the void forever and ever and ever and ever. But one other classic ride sends you to a much darker place. One of the original opening day rides at Disneyland, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, is based off the classic Wind in the Willow stories, featuring the hapless accidental criminal and lover of fast cars, Mr. Toad. The subject matter is already less innocent than your average Disney ride, featuring the Toad being framed for a crime and sent to jail. But what comes next still takes riders by surprise. After escaping from prison, Mr. Toad's fast car has an encounter with a train, and the final scene with the ride has the riders driving through a fiery landscape that's supposed to be hell. Many kids no doubt wanted to go back to It's a Small World after that ride, but it's far from the most chilling secret in the Disney rides. Another Disney classic, Pirates of the Caribbean, not only takes riders through a spooky ghost ship and a comical pirate raid, but it spawned a massively successful movie series. The ride remains one of the most popular rides at the park and has undergone many retouches over the years to remove the sexist and inappropriate imagery. But there was one change that Disney didn't hype up, and they probably hope most people don't know about it. When the ride first opened, it was filled with skeletons, meant to be the remains of pirates who had joined Davy Jones's locker. But many of them were actual skeletons, donated from UCLA's medical study program, that helped the skeletons look more real than any plastic double could. But at a certain point, people went, hey, should we re really have dead bodies in our fun carnival ride. So the skeletons were eventually removed, but it's believed that a few stray bones and skulls still remain. It's not the only place where you can find the dead in Disney. Welcome to the Haunted Mansion, maybe the most famous Disney ride in the world. This spooky and funny ride through a home of 999 happy haunts warns you that there's room for one more. But some people took it a little too seriously. The slow-moving Omnimover ride makes it easy for those looking to make their departed loved ones the 1,000th happy haunt to dump ashes in the dusty-looking mansion. This has happened so many times that Disney has had to issue warnings that dumping human remains is against the rules, and people have been banned from parks for giving their Disney-loving grandpa his last wish. No word on if any extra haunts have been cited at the ballroom. But it wasn't the only attraction where people got scared silly. Disney prides itself on being family-friendly, and a close encounter with a horror from another dimension did not seem to fit their brand. That didn't stop them from opening the extraterrestrial alien encounter in 1994, an immersive stage show that had more in common with a horror movie than their usual fare. First in the pre-show, a small and fluffy alien named Skippy was nearly fried alive by a sadistic robot. From there, audiences found themselves watching a teleporting demonstration where an alien monster was summoned. The theater was then plunged into total darkness as they felt the monster breathe on them, spray water on them, and shake their seats. Needless to say, audiences, especially little kids, were terrified and traumatized. The show only lasted eight years until it was rethemed to Lilo and Stitch, having the chaotic little alien to be the one to harass viewers. It was less scary but no more pleasant, and the attraction was closed for good in 2003. But sometimes Disney would rather you just forget that some of their attractions are, well, bad. The opening of a new Disney gate or theme park is always a huge event, and Disney wants to roll things out with a bang. In 1998, Animal Kingdom was a huge hit, and all eyes turned to the next opening, Disney's California Adventure in 2001. Not only was this a big new park, but it was only the second park in the much smaller Disneyland complex. There was just one problem. It was themed to California, and it was located in California. 
Few of the classic Disney characters were around, much of the park seemed like a wide-open generic carnival, and the park was quickly rejected by audiences as not worth the price of admission. Adding in fears of travel after the 9-11 terror attacks later that year, and the park was one of the biggest bombs in Disney's history, it was eventually rethemed, bringing in more Pixar and eventually Marvel characters, and is thriving now. But the same can't be said for one attraction often called the worst attraction in Disney history. The California theme was a puzzle to develop attractions around, but the designers wanted to pay tribute to Hollywood, so as design was happening in the 1990s, they came up with a new attraction called Superstar Limo. You would be a celebrity rushing to a big show, and you'd be chased by the paparazzi who wanted to get pictures of you. It was supposed to be a fun high-speed race until the beloved Princess Diana died in a car crash while escaping the paparazzi. The theme didn't seem fun anymore, and the photographers were replaced with caricatures of famous celebrities at the time and the ride drastically slowed down. The ride that eventually opened was seen as an embarrassment with an extremely short life. Some of the celebrities involved, like Drew Carey and Melanie Griffith, weren't exactly ones kids would know. Sure enough, it closed in less than a year and would later be reopened as a Monsters, Inc. ride. These are some black eyes for Disney, but it's far worse when things don't go as planned. Disney has been plagued by mechanical failures and crew issues since the very start and had a dramatic failure only a week after opening. The Disneyland Railroad, one of the more relaxing rides at the park, nearly had a tragic collision when a brakeman pulled his switch too soon, causing the caboose to derail. Many people were shaken up, but no one was injured. As for the brakeman, who had a very costly mistake, he apparently ran from the train and straight out of the park as soon as he realized what he had done and was never seen in the park again. But really, the opening of Disneyland was kind of a disaster in itself. Walt Disney had fought long and hard to get his dream park built, and no one was sure if it'd be a mega hit or a quagmire. The opening day was invite only and tickets were mailed to friends of Disney and celebrities. However, countless counterfeit tickets were sold and the crowd that showed up were double the expected numbers. Traffic to the park was backed up for miles, the food and drink supply were wiped out within hours, and the rides kept breaking down while many water fountains weren't working on a 100 degree day. The day was seen as an unmitigated disaster and one that hinted at just how big a hit this park was going to ultimately be. But sometimes things go horribly wrong more than once. Epcot Center is one of Disney's more sedate parks, designed to be an educational trip around the world and into the future. At least that's how it started out. They've added lots of thrill rides since, and one of them proved to be a little too much. Mission Space, a high-tech simulator that would take riders to Mars, opened in 2004 and shocked people with its intensity. Almost 200 guests were sickened and had to be treated by paramedics in the first year of operation. Then, two people died in less than a year's period after riding, one a child with an undiagnosed heart condition and the other a German woman with a pre-existing health issue. While no evidence was found that the ride actually caused their death or was unsafe for the average rider, it scared a lot of people and Disney ultimately added a less intense second version. But for one, repeated incidents meant the end. The Skyway was one of Disney's earliest attractions, a relaxing gondola ride from the land of one park to the other. The problem was, it was a rickety cable car ride high above the ground, and while the ride itself was safe, you couldn't account for everything. In Disneyland, a man fell 20 feet out of one of the cars and landed in front of the Alice in Wonderland ride. He sued Disney for his injuries, claiming it was unsafe, but admitted at trial that he had jumped out. Meanwhile, at Disney World, a crew member was accidentally knocked into an unsecured car when the Skyway started unexpectedly and later fell out, suffering minor injuries. But the final blow would come in 1999 when a 65-year-old custodian would fall out of the Skyway car while cleaning it. He suffered fatal injuries. The Skyway was deemed to be unsafe and Disney was hit with a hefty fine. These frequent incidents would ultimately spell the end of the Skyway altogether. One Disney ride is a massive hit, but Disney would rather you not look too closely at its roots. Splash Mountain is one of the most iconic Disney rides of all time, a musical log flume adventure that surrounds you with singing critters and then sends you down a massive splashdown. So why can't you really buy any merchandise of it? And why can't anyone see the movie these characters are from? Because Splash Mountain, featuring the Br'er Rabbit character as he attempts to outfox his enemies Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear, is based on the movie Song of the South, the only Disney movie to be fully disavowed by the company. 
Based on the Uncle Remus stories and featured an idealized version of life in the South during the Reconstruction era, it's considered by most people to be racist and full of stereotypes. It was wildly acclaimed at the time of its 1946 release, but since then has been pulled from circulation and isn't available on Disney+. Plus. So why did Disney build a massive ride based on it in the 1980s? No one knows, but they're finally retheming it to The Princess and the Frog, probably so they can finally sell merch based on it. But sometimes even opening a Disney park is a massive challenge. The first two Disney parks in Florida and California were massive hits, and the company wanted to branch out. But Euro Disneyland in Paris would not be an easy sell. French intellectuals believed it was an unacceptable invasion of American consumerism, while French farmers disrupted the construction in a protest over trade issues. The negativity got so extreme that one newspaper even jokingly said that someone should set fire to the complex. But despite protests at opening day, Euro Disneyland did open and completely bombed. As it turned out, the French just weren't that interested. It muddled through the early years before being rebranded as Disneyland Paris and has since found its footing, but the fierce opposition made Disney more cautious in which markets it expands to. But they never faced harsher opposition than they did in Virginia. It was going to be the biggest expansion in Disney history, a massive new theme park in Haymarket, Virginia, not far from a major Civil War battlefield. The concept was Disney's America, a theme park themed to American history and building on the educational elements of Epcot. Disney went so far as to pick an official site and plan to invest over half a million in early 1990s dollars, and then ran headlong into a tidal wave of opposition. Locals worried that Disney would overwhelm the historic sites and kill all the other tourist attractions in the area. Then Euro Disney bombed in 1994, and Disney became much more cautious about new investments. Additionally, unlike Disney's warm weather parks, this one would need to be closed for several months of the year during the winter. The final blow to Disney's America came when Disney tried to move the concept to California on the site of their rival Knott's Berry Farm, only for the owners to refuse to sell their property to Disney. And so Disney's America became the biggest Disney project never made. But there was no more shocking secrets about Disney than the ones about the man himself. Disney was very protective of his company and his property, but in the 1930s he took that way too far. While making his first full-length movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, he hired actress and singer Adriana Casalotti to voice the title character. She was a Hollywood rookie having worked as a chorus girl, and she was considered to be a massive success. Surely this would be the start of a massive Hollywood career, right? Wrong. Because Disney now saw her as the voice of Snow White, despite not being credited for it. He feared if she took other roles in film, it would spoil the illusion of Snow White and reportedly blocked her from getting other jobs. In recent years, she's gained more attention as the woman who made it all possible. But that's nothing compared to Walt Disney's darkest secret. Walt Disney was a traditional man, he loved America, and he wanted his theme park to reflect that. So he became infamous for a strict code of conduct for Disney employees, including regulating their facial hair. But he wound up taking this further than anyone knew. During the Red Scare and the Cold War, he was actually working for the US government, helping to identify potential communist agents in Hollywood. Of course, this hunt would soon grow completely out of control, sweeping up countless actors, directors, and writers. Many of them would be blacklisted and never work for the industry again. When Walt Disney died in the 1960s, the full extent of his work for the government was unknown, and it wouldn't be until the files were declassified decades later. They showed that he had actually received commendations and been promoted to a special agent of the FBI. It gives Disney is Everywhere a whole new meaning. Want to know more about the history of the company? Check out The Ugly Truth About Walt Disney for more on the man himself. Or check out Totally Messed Up Things That Have Happened at Walt Disney World for more on the dark secrets of the happiest place on Earth.